हेलो कीर्ति हेलो कीर्ति गुड मॉर्निंग ओके गुड मॉर्निंग अच्छी तरह है ना अच्छा मैम थर्टी थ्री या 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 अरे पंप इच ना नो अंदर की बाय नाइन फोर्टी बाग ना वाला नहीं ओके टेंट टेंट का इतना प्रिंसिपल के फोन जैस का तानो तांते सरे लेक अपोचे दिल कंटिन्यू ओके
Hello, Kirti. Uh, Ma'am, shall we start? Uh, yeah, yeah, undo, undo. Principal, talk, sir, call just. Okay. Hello. Mom, Can you hear audible, ma'am? Okay. Yeah. Good. Nice. Um, hello, everyone. Um, tell me when I am. I need to start. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Am I talking to Sai Kitti? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Principal, madam, join now. Tunaro, we are waiting for our principal to join. After that, we will start the session, please. Okay. No, okay. No. Kirti, Principal Madam, join Gang and Amin Guda uh, host Jay. Okay. Hello. 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 Rangana. Yeah. Rajini. Yeah. Rajini, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Rajini? Fine, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk. Yeah. At the end of the session, we have ample time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay.
waiting for uh, achita ma'am to join yeah yeah no worries let's yeah she said she'll be joining okay yeah it was as like you know the um, it was asking me to reinstall so it took a while for me okay okay our principal has come okay yeah principal ma'am mere unmute chesukochu okay okay yeah ma'am start cheyada ma yeah oh, start cheyada Okay. Good morning to all the participants and uh, guest Ranganayaki Madam, our principal. On behalf of uh, RBVRR Women's College and Department of uh, Biotechnology, I welcome all of you to this uh, webinar on biotechnology research to combat COVID-19. Now I request our principal ma'am, Dr. J. Achita Devi, to say a few words about our college. and uh, welcome the audience ma'am principal ma'am over to you good morning everyone i welcome you all for the one day webinar on biotechnology research to combat covid-19 organized by department of biotechnology botany and food and nutrition i would like to extend a special welcome to our guest ranganayaki from canada actually he is my colleague and my best friend thank you ranganayaki accepting our invitation Rajabahadur Venkat Rama Reddy Women's College was established in 1954 by Hyderabad Mahila Vidya Sangam. It is affiliated to Usmania University. The college was granted autonomous status for UG courses in 1989 by the UGC, and it was extended to PG courses from 2010-11. The college was selected as college with potential for excellence. The college was deaccredited by NAC in its fourth cycle. Reddy College is the vision of great stalwarts like Sri Raja Bahadur Venkat Rama Reddy Garu, Burgula Rama Krishna Rao Garu, Mada Pati Hanuman Rao Garu, and Sri K V Ranga Reddy Garu and others. The college also have very rare distinction that Sri Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the then Prime Minister of India, has laid the foundation stone, and the then Vice President of India, Dr. Sarvepalli Radha Krishnan, had inaugurated the college building. Simati Indira Gandhi inaugurated the hostel building, and Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam has graced the Golden Jubilee celebrations. From humble beginnings, Reddy College has grown to mammoth size with over 2,700 students on its rolls, providing hostel accommodation to more than 400 girls who hail from poor and remote areas of Telangana. It is the first college. to introduce bsc with forensic science course and msc data science in telangana state reddy college is the first women's college to introduce mba program it is also probably the only college in india metros dedicated for women education from poor families backgrounds i i hope this uh, webinar uh, will helpful for the students as well as for fac faculty who are, who want to who are likely to continue their research thank you over to nanda thank you very much ma'am uh, i thank you once again from your busy schedule you have taken few minutes thank you once again ma'am uh, now i'll uh, introduce our uh, guest ranganayaki nandanavanam she is a good friend of mine as achita ma'am has said Uh, basically ranganayaki ma'am is a molecular biologist with over 8 years of experience in both academic as well as industrial research laboratories uh, she did her masters in uh, molecular biology uh, from ubc that is the university of uh, british columbia vancouver canada and uh, she did her phd in microbiology from usmania university she has a solid knowledge and experience in molecular biology cell culture molecular biology uh, microbiology immunology and biochemical methods and techniques she, her strong interest is in antibody engineering gene expression profile studies and biochemical and physiological characterization she worked in various research laboratories at the university of british columbia conducted research on gene expression in microbial systems 
to design antibodies, genomic-based diagnostics, and membrane transporter gene, and also collaborated with industry and government research laboratories in Canada. She has uh, published a number of uh, research uh, journals, to name a few, like, for example, uh, Canadian Journal of Plant Science, uh, Current Science, European Journal of Soil Science, etc., and also the Philippine Journal of Science. She has uh, many presentations also to her credit. Uh, at present, Madam is a secondary science and biology teacher, Langley School District, Langley, uh, where she is working on developing teaching methods in integrated and algorithmic STEAM education. Madam has got a number of awards, certificates, in addition uh, to training, like to name a few, like NCERC Visiting Scientist Fellowship, University of British Columbia, Canada, International Student Fellowship, University of British Columbia, Canada, CSIR Research Associate Fellowship, India, National Merit Scholarship, India, uh, Professional Development for International Teaching Assistant Center for Intellectual Communication, UBC, GLP for Pharmaceutical and Biotechnology, Industry, USA, BCIT. This is a very brief introduction about our ma'am. And uh, now I request Ranganaiki ma'am to start the session. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again. I welcome you to the session. Thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, thanks to all the organizers. And uh, I'm really excited like when Nanda uh, called me and asked, can you give us a, a lecture on this? So I was so excited. Oh, and then I started telling it, with, uh, conversing with my family and I was saying, oh, Ready College uh, faculty asked me to do the lecture and I was so excited and I was eagerly waiting for this day. So uh, with this uh, brief uh, 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 intro, like um, how I'm excited to share my ideas. So I think I'm going to share my screen now uh, with the PowerPoint, uh, like I will run through the slides and uh, we, I will try to share whatever ideas and whatever uh, knowledge I have gained in this area of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And so I'm going to share the screen now. Okay, and uh, give me a second, yeah. Okay. So today's topic uh, is, uh, we, are, we are going to talk about uh, biotechnology research to combat COVID-19. So, um, I just want to give a brief introduction, like already uh, a lot been talked about uh, uh, me, like introduced by uh, Achita ma'am and then Nanda ma'am gave a very good intro of mine. And so I just wanted to tell you, so from Hyderabad, Telangana, like uh, I was working 14 years, I worked at uh, Ready Women's College. That's where I started my teaching career after my master's program. And then I worked 14 years over there and uh, RBBRR Women's College gave me an opportunity to uh, continue my academics and I have completed my PhD there uh, with the Osmani University. I, and then after my PhD, I traveled across the Pacific and I landed in Vancouver, Canada. And I got an invitation from University of British Columbia to work as a visiting scientist in the Department of Botany. So I started working in the Department of Botany, University of British Columbia, and I was working on gene expression profile and uh, uh, membrane transport genes there. So this is my, these are my career highlights. So I joined department at UBC as a visiting scientist and then after joining here, I thought maybe I should get some experience and ex uh, training in biotechnology. So I started doing a master's 
a second master's in my biotechnology and I graduated from there. And then here uh, is my department here at University of British Columbia. And uh, so a part of like, there's a big group of faculty scientists and all working in here. And uh, so I joined the group, uh, a team where who are, who are working on the nitrate transport gene in the, uh, which helps in uptake, nitrate uptake from the soil. And then from then uh, I moved into the medical research and then I worked with the faculty of medicine antibody engineering facility. And there I worked as a molecular biologist. If you see uh, in this picture, I'm just, I was analyzing some gene sequences over there. That's the real time PCR thing. So that's how I started my research over there. And I worked on uh, like a recombinant uh, proteins and then how to, um, we were, our team was working on uh, single chain antibody production. So we used to use the human genome and then uh, started working on the antibodies. So now with that, uh, with those details, I'm going to go into the, uh, our topic. So today we are all joined here to learn about the major pandemic. And you have, it's already been for the past four months, we are facing this and we are trying to uh, come out of this uh, pandemic and finding out strategies and how to, but still we lost so many lives and still we are struggling to put a stop to this one. So thank you for joining and giving me the opportunity to share my ideas. So today we are discussing about how biotechnology can help us to combat this uh, COVID-19. Uh, I'm just wondering, how do I minimize uh, this part? Okay. Okay. Good. So, So this is an overview. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about the virus, the structure, and then about the pandemic. And then what are the diagnostics and immune response and therapeutics and vaccines? So what is the role of biotechnology in that? So let's, uh, so this most of you have seen these pictures by now. And so this is, uh, model that is created and it shows this is how the COVID-19 virus is. And we see that the most interesting part that scientists are involved in doing their research is about these spike proteins that are present on the surface. So there are three proteins that you can see here, E protein, spike proteins, and M proteins. So spike proteins are the ones that uh, uh, scientists are working on. So let's uh, uh, look into the details of this. So COVID-19 uh, can readily attack human cells at multiple points. So why, what does it mean? Why it can uh, uh, attack multiple points is because of these spike proteins. And what is that speciality of the spike proteins? We are going to look into that. So basically the main uh, targets are the lungs and throats, uh, but uh, you can, they can attack multiple organs in the body. So why is, again, the answer is spike proteins. And so among all the viruses that attack humans, coronaviruses are big, in their size and they're about 125 nanometers in diameter. And um, so coronaviruses have the largest uh, genome and then um, they have of, uh, of all the RNA viruses and about 
30,000 genetic bases are present, largest genome. And usually uh, in viruses, if we use some drugs or treatment so that weakens the virus by inducing mutations. But coronavirus have a special uh, proofreading mechanism. It has a genomic proofreading mechanism by which mutations caused by drugs are wiped off. So if we use any treatment also, it would not work because it has the gen genomic proofreading mechanism. What is it? Uh, am I going too fast? Is, uh, is my, can you all hear me? What is? Yes, ma'am, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. No problem, no problem. Very so, clear. Yeah. So let us see what is this uh, proofreading mechanism? What, what is that speciality? So usually, as I mentioned, mutations have advantages for viruses. And influenza virus, which is uh, um, which every year we try to get the flu vaccine, and there will be a, a different strain because these viruses they mutate a lot, and e that's why mu uh, influenza virus mutates three times more than the coronavirus. How they mutate? So then, why this coronavirus is a big? Uh, uh, problem and why it is causing this pandemic, uh, like uh, this pandemic situation. So because uh, this influenza virus, the virus that when it mutates, it sidesteps all the vaccines and every year we need to take a new vaccine. But what happens is in this case of uh, coronavirus, what it does is it frequently recombines by trading a chunk, a chunks of RNA with the other coronavirus. For example, you have two virus particles over there. And what it does is uh, it exchanges some uh, bits of RNA between those two. And then that's how the evolution like uh, taking place. So this is the unique mechanism happening over here. So that is why you, uh, it is hard to uh, control this one. So they are frequently recombined by trading chunks of RNA with other coronavirus. When two distancy related coronavirus end up in the same cell, let us say, then they become more stronger, strongest versions because they are trading this RNA among them. So always whenever there is two different cells and you are exchanging genetic material that gives you more vigor. And so they become more stronger. So this makes them infect new cell types and they jump to, uh, they even jump to other species. And what is the jumping to other species will go across because the source from where the source is coming. So uh, let us see this one. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going back. Yeah, so here this coronavirus, has a genome like uh, it is also called SARS coronavirus 2. And uh, this one has 96% similarity in the genetic material with the virus that is found in the bats. And, uh, but this SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein that is present on that. So there is a the receptor binding site is different and more efficient than one that is found in the bat virus. Although what I'm trying to tell you here is we, although there is a 96% similarity in the genetic material with the virus that is found in the bat, the spike protein receptor binding site or binding domain is different and it is more efficient than that is present in the bat virus. And the another research came up and they, uh, so in that study they found out that 90% similarity in the genetic material with the virus found in the scaly anteater. It is called pangolin. And this scaly anteater um, had a receptor binding domain that is 
almost identical to the human version of SARS-CoV-2, like COVID, coronavirus 2. So, uh, but it is not from that. So it is again, 90% similarity and 96% similarity. You see the difference. So genetic material from bat virus is 96% similar, while with the pangolin anteater, uh, that is the scaly anteater that has 90% similarity. So, but the binding protein is uh, very close to the human version. So that is why now scientists are thinking that you uh, people need to put more focus on this and how these viruses are coming. So that's why one of the scientists from University of Berkeley, by evolutionary biologist, and Nielsen, and he said in his in these words, like that's why I put it in quotations. He said there should be like a continued surveillance and uh, increased vigilance towards the emergence of new viral strains by genotic transfer, like coming from the animal animals. So this is what people, uh, evolutionary biologists are thinking. This is about the lineage, how this virus is related to bat virus and how it is related to pangolin virus. So with this uh, background, let us see how the infection spreads. So you, I have uh, also uh, watched the webinar by a uh, IICT scientist, uh, uh, like um, in the RBR website. So there you had very a lot of very detailed information about how the infection uh, takes place. So that's why I'm not going into too many details because the focus today is how biotechnology is going to answer that. But I'm going to quickly uh, or just give you a brief overview about how the infection happens and why and why I am saying the infection has two open doors. Because the coronavirus that caused common cold uh, attacked the upper respiratory tract. While, uh, like for example, uh, then the uh, uh, MER coronavirus and the SARS coronavirus, they get hold to the lungs. Then what is this COVID virus doing, COVID-19 or SARS coronavirus too? Unfortunately, it can do both. That's why I said it has two open doors. So it can, first thing, it can attack the upper respiratory tract. Second thing is it can also hold on to the lungs. So, and also we, I mentioned in the, my first uh, slide that a uh, few slides that it can attack multiple organs also. So, so that's how it, uh, uh, in, the infection works. And for example, if you take a situation, if a neighbor uh, who is ne a person next to you, if he coughs, and let us say you have 10 virus particles, it gets your way, that is enough to start the infection in the throat. But the hair like cilia can clear off those viruses. But if a neighbor coughs 100 virus particles towards you, the virus can all the way get down to your lungs. So what is that telling us? So the viral load is what that plays more uh, plays a role. So it can get down to the lungs. So that is how the uh, infection is, the rate of infection is happening. So how virus get down to the lungs? How is it going there? Is it moving cell by cell? Uh, like, uh, you know, once uh, it gets into the human cell or tissue, and then how it is moving cell by cell? Or is it washed down to the lungs is still not known. And some scientists are thinking that there would be a cytokine storm that would uh, cause all this um, and, uh, mortality and all those uh, severe uh, uh, problems, uh, health issues. 
So, but uh, still it is not known and research is still going on to understand more about this biology of this patho pathology and how it is working. Still every day it is very dynamic and every day you see a different news and new research is coming, uh, coming into light. So it is changing very dynamic. Uh, so as of now, whatever knowledge we have, this is what we are thinking. So the virus can start in the throat or in the nose and it uh, by producing a cough and disrupting the taste and smell, like, you know, causing problems with your olfactory uh, senses. And then uh, it, it can stop there. So that is mild symptoms. So it can end there. That means it can stop there and those are the mild symptoms. And sometimes what happens, let us see, what is this mechanism, how the entry mechanism happens and uh, where it for, how it further gets and damages the lungs and why it is leading to mortality. So people call it as, uh, like, you know, they use all different names. So people call it as deadly invaders. So a lot of research going on. This is the source from a nature public, uh, an article published in Nature. Uh, so this is the virus, uh, COVID-19 virus with the spike proteins. And these are the M proteins. And this ACE2 is the receptor. So when what happens is the spike protein that uh, tries to enter the thing. So this is coming, ACE2 protein is coming and trying to, but at this time, this furin is the one that enzyme that attacks, that dissolves, uh, that gives the way to this uh, virus particle to enter, make, make an entry. So this enzyme, furin is enzyme, or another enzyme is that uh, TMPRSS2. So these, these are working external to the host cell, and then they are helping these spike proteins. And so that dissolves the membrane and it can make an entry into the human tissue. So now, uh, so you see here, the furin is combining uh, with the spike protein and producing the uh, uh, peptides, fusion peptides. And let's see what is happening in the next step. So once it uh, reaches, so it releases the uh, RNA and then the mechanism, it starts producing the proteins and then again, assembly take of the virus takes place and then it is heading out to infect another cell. So this is how the entry mechanism is happening. So, um, and this one, this picture is um, uh, an electron micrograph picture from a uh, infected person. So this is, uh, and uh, colorized, they have given some color, color, uh, colors to this one when they're taking the pictures. So this one, you see the green, all the green things, uh, uh, small, small, this whole green particles are the virus particles. And then these are the cell, uh, the, this is the cell, ap apoptic cell is the cell that is in the stage of uh, death, cell death is happening here. And then this, all this green thing is a virus. So this is captured at the integrated research facility. The credit of this image goes to them. And uh, so you can see how much uh, infection, how many virus particles are there in this cell. So this is just an idea. So I, I did not go into more details about the infection process because you already had a lecture in that. So it will be a repetition. So I just touch based like how it affects and how, what is the enzyme that is playing the role for the entry. The furin enzyme is the one that plays the role for the entry of the virus into the human tissues. So now, 
what is this pandemic? Uh, like why, why the rapid spread and wh what is happening, current data? So if we look into this, so in and today's, uh, like I was looking through some websites and today's number is about uh, 6.7 million people worldwide um, are infected and about the uh, death rate, 393,900 a month. So, so many thousands uh, are almost killed. So this is the number. So most people who are, so with this mortality rate, so what is this one? Actually, people are saying that most people infected with this COVID-19, they only experience mild or even no symptoms. But high mortality rates are mainly, why this high mortality rate? It is mainly driven by the patients who are more susceptible to respiratory failure because they have the pre-existing condition of respiratory distress syndromes or pneumonia and all, or other potential factors for this rapid mortality, increase in the mortality rate is cardiovascular diseases, obesity, diabetes, and then hypertension. So these are some other factors that contribute to this respiratory failure. So this is the reason like not like a healthy person, they are, although they are getting infected, they are showing mild symptoms or even no symptoms or they are recovering. But uh, people like, you know, all these uh, old people and then those who have respiratory distress syndromes and uh, obesity, diabetes, these are the people who are uh, um, ending up with a lot of uh, uh, severe symptoms and it is saving them is becoming very, uh, very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. So now with this ideas and I'm going to move on to the next one that is about so how do we diag uh, what are the diagnostic tests that are available? So and you might have heard about this and uh, a lot in the media. So basically there are two types of diagnostics that are available to uh, check whether you have COVID-19 or not. So first one is the viral test that tells you if you have a current infection. So this is what when you get to go on a hospital site where you need go for a, a check, like whether you need, uh, you have uh, um, a COVID-19 virus uh, or current infection. So what they do is they collect your swab like inside the nose or they collect the sputum and then they, uh, they do the tests and then they'll tell you mostly they do the PCR tests and other type of analysis and then they tell you if you have currently, like if you have infection right at that time. Mm -hmm. And so that infection with uh, SARS-CoV-2, like, you know, the this is the virus and why uh, this is the name given because this is started in the novel virus started special with the special characteristics in year 19. So that's why we, we are given, like this name is given to the virus. Actual, it is SARS-CoV-2. And uh, the second one test that they use, uh, like they do, is the antibody test. So these tests tells you if you had a previous infection. And these are also called a serology tests. So what they do is they test if you were uh, like uh, blood by looking at the antibodies, if you have them, then they think that you might have a pre-existing condition, like, you know, you have previously been exposed to that. And that, and so that's why, although you are not currently, uh, like you do not have infection, you have recovered, if you had those antibodies, that means you might have got exposed to the virus. So that is what, whether, 
So if it gives positive, what do you need to do so is the next thing. So if antibody test gives positive, then you need to go for further analysis. You will be discussing with the, uh, your doctor and then you are going there, uh, for further analysis like this kind of swaps to, to figure out whether you have current infection or not. So these are the two basic tests that are currently uh, going on. And so in, there is a lot, about, a lot going on about the serology tests and the antibody tests. And because uh, like initially they started talking about, oh, it's giving fa false positives and all. It's basically, it is not false positives. It is basically you have, have those antibodies. That means I'm not saying, I'm not promoting any product here. I'm just saying that you had previous infection or whatever, you've been mild uh, exposed and, but you had mild symptoms or you did not, you were asymptomatic, you did not show any symptoms, but your body did uh, have developed these antibodies. So this is what um, the diagnostics talk about. And then once, then next is the therapeutics. And a uh, lot of discussion went on in your previous lecture. So very few details. So, uh, so this malaria drug, hydro, hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir, and these were the drugs they tried. And, but still um, they do have some side effects and all. So can bring it down, but we don't know how effective they are. What is their efficacy? But uh, the research is going on. Some of the companies, like uh, I think Amgen and other companies, they are working on this adaptive antibody technology to bring out some therapeutics. So what uh, for some treatment? Uh, is, there, is everything OK? Uh, can I continue? I hear no, some. No problem. Yeah. no problem. No problem. Oh, OK. So adaptive antibody technologies are the ones that they're uh, trying you, they're trying to use to develop some therapeutics. What they do is they try to uh, cover or coat the virus or blank, like, you know, blanket the virus with these antibodies so, so that they can reduce the infection rate. So this is a type of, and uh, what they're trying to do is B cell antibody factories. And uh, so they collect that and they are basically doing uh, those, uh, collecting those antibodies and they're doing the immune profiling and screening for the, what is that super antibody candidate that can stop this virus. So research is going on in these two uh, areas, and then they want to develop this adaptive antibody technology as a treatment. So uh, now let's move on to what is this vaccines doing? So vaccines, this is where we are this. Uh, so from, from diagnostics, so in the, in the case of diagnostics, biotechnology plays a role and then therapeutics, biotechnology plays a role and vaccines, what is biotechnology doing here? So let us see. Um, okay. So vaccines, how they start, like I was talking about the spike proteins, the M proteins and all. So the virus, once it enters, this is the ACE2 receptor. And once it enters into the human tissue, and again, the, it releases the RNA, and then the, it was, uh, this RNA is viral RNA is translated into proteins, and then the virus gets assembled and the virus gets released. And once the virus is released, and this is the, body, uh, like you see, this is the human cell and this is the outside. So this is entering. And then once inside this, so viral 
peptides are produced and these virus ingested uh, is it is ingested by the antigen uh, so that what happens is this b cells and then t helper cells the these are the immunity immunity like basically here the immune response starts once this virus is integrated by uh, into the antigen part. So what happens is once the immune response starts, so uh, the specialized antigen presenting cells engulf this virus and then display that to the T helper cells and that's how T helper cells enable the other immune responses and B cells make the antibodies and these antibodies and they are anti-corona antibodies and they capture this virus and then uh, that's how the, those, those are destroyed and finally uh, the antibodies are there and then you can have the memory antibody long-lived memory of B cells and T cells even in future infection you have the immunity. This is in general how immunity works, how we develop immunity for any virus that is entering of course for this coronavirus that is entering in this case mm -hmm. so basically the immune response how it is uh, developing mm -hmm. and one second okay i have put something like i thought i will bring it closer to you so that you can see what is happening so yeah so you can see what is uh, just in a closed view. Now, how does a vaccine work? So I did talk about the how the immune response starts. So vaccines expose the body to an antigen which does not cause disease and then it triggers the body's immune response that can block or kill the virus if a person gets infected like the previous one once it exposes that one so it can block the body and it can kill that one so that the person gets uh, 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 like when the person get infected with that. So when you are exposed to that, so this is, this is how the vaccine works. Like vaccine exposes the body to an uh, uh, antigen, which does not cause the disease. And it triggers the body's immune response that can block or kill the virus if a person get infected. Now, what is the research going on where we are at the vaccine development? So there are at least eight types of vaccines are being tried against the coronavirus. And they rely on different viruses or viral parts that can be used. And uh, eight different types, I think now they are testing about 152 candidates. So what are these um, eight different types? So it can be an in inactivated virus or it can be a weakened virus. Uh, so they are virus using virus vaccines. And the second one could be nucleic acid vaccines, the DNA and RNA vaccines. And the third type is viral vectors, replicating viral vectors and non-replicating viral vectors. And then protein based, that is protein subunits, and then the virus like particles. So these are the different types of vaccines they are working on. Research is still going on and it has not come out yet. And uh, they're saying that it will be there soon. And some every day we see some different here, some pro progress in the vaccine development in the news. And we see, we hear about that. So these are, the, and this graph is showing you where the virus vaccines are up to here. 
and then the five, and then the viral vectors are more in progress, and the nucleic acids are also they are working on it, and protein based and the other viruses, other type of vaccines. What are these other type of vaccines? Is the they are also thinking about these kind of vaccines? Would they be useful to? Uh, the, any other type of uh, virus attacks are so that is what they are working on. So here is how the virus vaccine works: the weakened virus and the inactivated virus. So the vaccine is injected, and then here um, the inactivated virus is we are. The, this weakened virus is basically the idea is once it is inside the cell or inside the human body, that's where the virus replicates and that triggers the immune system and develops the antibodies. Mm -hmm. And this is the inactivated one where you are sending that will also trigger your immune response. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second type of vaccines are the nucleic acid vaccines. And these are DNA vaccines. And uh, so coronavirus uh, spike protein, uh, sp uh, spike gene is incorporated into this and then it is injected. Like uh, they use a method called electroporation and then try to insert the uh, DNA virus. And similarly, the RNA vaccines. And usually RNA vaccines are uh, coated with uh, some kind of lipid because RNA is very unstable. So they, they try to coat it with a kind of lipid and then this is what uh, they are trying to uh, inject into the cell and then see how it is uh, working. And uh, this company, Moderna A and in association are in collaboration with NIH, National Institute of uh, Health. In US. So they are trying out different dosages. How much uh, DNA we, sh we can inject or how much RNA, how what is the dosage? So they are trying to inject 25 micrograms to 100 micrograms and 250 micrograms dosage of these. And also how frequent it should be. It is just one time or they need to do it uh, like um, periodically. So these are the various other details they are still working on, still research is going on in this, uh, in, at this level. Now, the other type of vaccines are viral vectors and protein-based vaccines. So here viral vectors, the replicating viral vector is injected. And in this case, non-replicating viral vectors are sent. So the coronavirus spike protein is here inserted into the RNA and uh, this is uh, the antigen is presenting uh, to the cell and that produces the immune response. Here the virus particle, virus replicates over here that produces the immune response. Our protein subunits, that is the spike protein subunits they, uh, they are injected and they produce, they induce this immune response. Our virus-like particles are sent and that would also induce the immune response. These are the various different uh, types of uh, viral or, and vector, viral vector-based and protein-based vaccines uh, are uh, being tested. So, uh, so we are working on the uh, uh, how to uh, in get the immune response or immunity by uh, and the research on the vaccines. And what is this herd immunity? So people started talking about herd immunity. So when large percentage of people 
uh, become immune to a disease, what I'm trying to define this, they become immune to a disease, then the spread of the disease slow down. And it slows down or it, uh, or it can also stop because the chain can break. Like many, like mm -hmm. when there is, more, many people are infected and that develops and once you get infected, you are developing immune, uh, immunity in your body. Antibodies are getting uh, ready in your body. So because once you are immune, so then you are not uh, spreading that. So you are already immune to that one. So that's how uh, this uh, herd immunity works. So many viral and bacterial infections spread from person to person. And this chain is broken when most people don't get the infection or they do not transmit the infection. So that is what herd immunity. So this would develop over a period of time, but it is not, you cannot leave for any, like a chance, you leave it to chance. And the, what, what is this herd immunity? How does it help? So this, this herd immunity helps uh, to protect people who are not vaccinated. If they're not vaccinated and this herd immunity will protect them or who have low functioning immune systems like immune compromised people. And, uh, and they may develop infection. Those who can develop an infection very easily, those are the people who can be protected by this herd immunity because no, if there is no vaccination. Happening. So this is uh, herd immunity. And with that, uh, so basically, I just want to go back and give you an overview about, so we did talk about three things. Uh, that is, we talked about diagnostics, we talked about therapeutics and vaccines, and how to in, uh, develop the immune response to this virus. That is where we talked about all the different uh, vaccines, different types of vaccines that are being tested. And so virus vaccines, nucleic acid vaccines, viral vector and protein-based vaccines. And so, and we talked about herd immunity. These are all the different uh, ideas and different trials we are doing to get that immunity uh, in the people who and so that they will be protected from this virus and what are the challenges so this is another thing so what are the challenges that biotech is facing in this vaccine research or in developing the therapeutics what is this so first thing vaccine research so any therapeutics or any vaccine it should be safe and it should work that is the main thing. Main goal is the vaccine that you are developing, it should be safe one to administer. And it should also work. And is it only one time? Like, would it be uh, helpful for in future also? Like, how long? That the length, the timeline also, like, uh, is how long it is effective. So all this uh, is the challenge. And again, timeline is like how much time will it take to develop a vaccine? And we're going to discuss about that. So like I, if we, I was uh, listening to some interviews and one of the uh, biotech company, uh, they were saying that it may take a year or a year and a half to bring out a vaccine. And then Funding is also another big challenge. So where is the money? So how to fund this research? They need a lot of funding. So funding is also another challenge. And the next thing is the process that involved in developing these therapeutics or vaccines. So first thing is like, uh, first one, the general test should be done in animals and then in humans. So clinical studies in human that involves three phases, like phase one trial, 
phase two trials and phase three trials. Phase one trial is to check whether it is safe. Phase two is to check the efficacy and uh, adequate neutralizing antibodies are available or not. And phase three is about the patient recruitment and large number of people has to be tested for the efficacy. So these are the three different phases. And next, apply for the license of the vaccine the biotech companies produce and then distribution and marketing. So these are all the various stages at every stage. Uh, whenever they are thinking about a technology, doing some research, whether they need to think about whether to go or not, whether this would be safer, will it, whether it has the capacity or the effic efficiency, that whether, whether it is working, what would be the timeline to bring out the vaccine, where are the funds, all these are the different like a uh, list of challenges that biotech research faces. And so actually, so I was talking about the trials, phase one trial, phase two trial, and uh, the traditional process timeline is like this, about any, any vaccine or any drug to come out, this is the timeline. So it would take like basic research would take about two years or three years. And then the preclinical studies and then the clinical studies about approximately any year and two. These are like they can do it sometimes. They can do the studies fast. So but clinical and then the new drug application. And again, a, a review has to happen in one year and then post-marketing surveillance, like once they send it to the market, how, what, what would be, is there any recall or what is happening? What are the side effects? Uh, would, would that be leading to a recall? All these are the various stages and uh, uh, like at every step, uh, there is, they need to overcome each and every step to get through this. So these clinical trials are the ones, phase one, phase two, phase three trials. Like uh, initially they recruit small numbers and safety in phase one. And then they do the phase two, again, small numbers, safety, dosage and administration, how it should be given. Is it a oral one? Is it a, a intradermal or intramuscular? What kind of thing and what should be the frequency? And then the large number, uh, then phase three involves large number of people, large number of patients to be uh, recruited and then they check for the efficacy and safety. Now, this is the traditional process. And now going into like meeting the need uh, in the current situation, we need to do it something urgent. We cannot wait for so many years. So. There is an urgent need for vaccines, therapeutics and all. So biotech companies are given permission to reduce the sample size. And uh, uh, for each phase, they can reduce the number of tests or sample size and also prioritize review by regulatory agencies. So like usually regulatory agencies like FDA and all other uh, different like uh, in India, uh, also, there will be central regulatory agencies like that. So all these regulatory agencies, they need to uh, do the, review this, whatever uh, studies they have done, clinical studies, whatever uh, documentation they provide. So that has to be reviewed. So prioritized review and fast track regulatory approval. These are the three things they are considering now to bypass so like it is not bypassing steps, but only re reducing the timeline and reducing the number of patients to be recruited. So now this is again, uh, uh, just a overview of how the traditional uh, clinical studies takes place and how the outbreak uh, uh, is uh, making to overlap certain phases. Like here, this is the one. So clinical development, safety, doses selection, and safety efficacy. 
here is the overlap happening. And so they can quickly produce and the large scale, uh, scale manufacturing can be done and it can be distributed quickly. So if you look into this, these are the different stages for the traditional the, um, vaccine productions. So now let's move on to how biotech companies are working to combat this, like that is our title of this lecture. So this is a 2020 century challenge, like we are, uh, biotech companies are working on. Now, interestingly, like uh, usually the biotech companies, although there exists in normal situation, there is some type of coordination and collaboration. Mostly they, at this point of time, everyone has come together and a lot of coordination and collaboration, goodwill is there. So they are not looking for any commercial benefits. They are looking for uh, uh, how to overcome this, how to stop this, how to bring out a vaccine, how to uh, we can protect people. Uh, so that is what the main goal. So that's why they are working together and the biotech companies now have their technology capability and they do have the right science. There are a lot of research going on, a lot of, uh, they have uh, now at this point of time, they are getting some funding and uh, uh, government policies are also helping them to coordinate like tripartite uh, model collaboration is what happening industries, uh, uh, mm -hmm. academia and government. Academia is where like uh, academic research goes on in the universities and uh, uh, government and industry, they're all collaborating to bring out this vaccine as soon as possible. So that is what biotech companies are doing at this time. And really they're all forming a coalition and then they are working, coordinating with each other. Now, with this, what is our responsibility? So I thought I should uh, do this one, although we are talking about how biotechnology research is helping us, what is our responsibility? How we can uh, stop? What is our part, our role in this? So first thing is know about COVID-19. So you are attending so many webinars and you are reading news, uh, watching the news and all that. So you, uh, you are getting a lot of knowledge from the media and also many of these kind of uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. So know about this virus, then know how this virus spreads. Like uh, you can become infected by coming in contact with any person about six feet or two arm length with a person who has coronavirus, COVID-19. So it is uh, spread from person to person. So you can become infected from respiratory droplets. And in fact, through a person, if the person coughs or sneezes or talks. Mm. So that is why they're asking you to do the social distancing. So protect yourself and also protect others from this COVID-19. And uh, if possible, you don't need to wear the medical mask, just if possible, wear a cloth mask, cloth uh, covering your uh, nose and mouth in public settings. So, and then clean and disinfect uh, touched surfaces, wash your hands for 20 seconds. And there is here uh, for uh, students, what we say is when you are washing your hands, say happy birthday twice. So like 20 seconds, how to count. So we tell them like, say happy birthday twice. So like that, so wash your hands and practice social distancing and prevent the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And if you are sick, stay home and avoid public transportation, ride sharings are traveling in taxis and cabs and stay home, separate yourself from other people and also pets in your home. And this is, uh, there is no 
as we have learned so far that there is no specific treatment still working on research is going on so but you can seek medical help depending on your symptoms so you can be treated so if you need medical attention call them and then you can get there to them so know your risk for severe illness so uh, so everyone is at the risk and older adults and people of any age who have severe underlying medical conditions they are at high risk and if you are if you there are older people at home so you should be very careful and give uh, and do not go and give them hugs because they are more susceptible so that's why uh, stay uh, practice social distance okay with this i just want to talk about what is the future of biotechnology i think i do have in the audience some of the biotechnology students and so i thought maybe i touch base this so today world is looking to biotechnology for solutions to address this prolonged public health crisis so this pandemic is demo, uh, demonstrating the power of biotechnology their cap capability so knowledge and training in biotechnology will help to prevent future pandemics so biotechnology has this capability to bring that revolution in the diagnostics therapeutics and vaccine production so if you choose to do the uh, be in this career you work for biotechnology or you are not just doing that bio job like you are doing okay i'm doing this project and i'm um, uh, this is my results and all not that you are doing something useful to the society bear that in mind and all these years like biotechnology was not getting that much attention like more, more it, i'm not saying that uh, in that context like more focus was on to other type of jobs like uh, um, uh, finance and other types now world is looking to biotechnology so share your knowledge scientific knowledge and then help the society by uh, gaining more knowledge and training in this so with that uh, i thank a big thank you to the organizers principal dr j achita devi dr p nanda devi department of biotechnology department botany department of botany and food and nutrition rbvrr women's college and rbvrr women's college management and a big thank you to all those who joined this webinar today and for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas and thoughts about this thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you very much uh, there are few questions from the participants uh, over okay. to Keith. Kirti. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ma'am, we have some questions. Uh -huh. First question. Do I need to stop sharing uh, my thing? Yeah, maybe. Yes, ma'am. I need to... On the top, you will have stop sharing, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. Ma'am, first question for you. Mm -hmm. Is there any choice of destroying RNA in the way of transporting to make it less stronger any chance of what is that uh, something distorted uh, like destroying I RNA. I, destroying rna okay in the way yeah. of transporting to make it less stronger uh, the i mean you mean the virus rna right to me without so basically virus when it is trans uh transferring it it has that uh, particle slow it is uh, uh infected because of the droplets like so i i think uh, the only way that we can do that is by not getting exposed to the rna uh, in the form of that virus particles so maintaining social distance is the only answer and also 
maintaining some hygiene and surface uh, cleanings and all but uh, i am not as of now they're not uh, there is no such research that they can destroy the rna like uh, in the particles before transmitting from one person to other yeah. thank you ma'am next uh, question mm -hmm. some of the people are not showing any symptoms of covid why yeah then have it continue in the asymptomatic without treating yeah so as i mentioned in one of my slides so it starts uh, at uh, uh, it has two doors i said like first it starts at the upper respiratory tract and then it can get down to the lungs so when it starts and as i mentioned like our body has its own uh, immune immunity so what it does is it can stop the virus like mm -hmm. and that's why they are not showing r uh, so that is why they are able to recover and uh, by not showing very mild symptoms are not showing any symptoms so that is the reason like uh, but those who doesn't have a good immune system in their body those are the people who are getting uh, uh, exposed to this virus are becoming targets to this virus and what was the second part of the question did i answer both the questions how will it continue in the asymptomatic without treatment continuing in the asymptomatic without treatment so there is no treatment as of now and they are asymptomatic they are not showing symptoms but they do test positive then what they uh, what they do is like they need to go and if they think we we cannot diagnostics are not able to show uh, um whether they have the uh, current infection so what they need to do is they should go to the uh, swab test although so because you are not you are not showing symptoms you don't get the question about whether you get infected you got the infection but then that means so when to test that whether you are uh, you have you are asymptomatic or not there should be a community testing happening so but some people are trying to do but they are not doing at this time most of the are not doing the community testing yes, only if people show some symptoms and they that's when they are doing the testing actually they have to do the community testing to figure out who who is showing positives and then they should be taken to the further test like doing the swab test to see whether they have the current infection so that community test testing should be coming should come out yeah should be implemented yeah next question ma'am mm -hmm. uh, will the virus spread from humans to animals uh it can jump from species to species that's what the research is talking about because it has the trick of proofreading itself recombinant so as of now uh like there were many questions like because people they have their pets at home are they going at this point of time there is no ev such evidence recorded like we have pets at home so most of them uh, people they have pets at home but is it spreading from humans to the animals no uh, as of now no record mom next question a japanese mm -hmm. professor of physiology Tasuko Honju mm -hmm. said the virus is genetically engineered one, not natural. Is it true? Uh, we did discuss about the lineage of the virus. Mm -hmm. I am not getting into the uh, uh, arguments like uh, research arguments or political arguments. The I discussed about the lineage and I discussed about the two. Uh, uh lineages like one is about the bat corona virus and one is about the uh scaly anteater pangolin corona virus and the uh, similarities 96% similarity with the bat 
and 90% similarity with the anteater. And then, but the, the difference would be the spike proteins mm -hmm. and the close relationship it is showing with the pangolin anteater. So at, at this time, because it is not, uh, it is in between those two, the people say that it is engineered, but no, it is not. So far, as of now, whatever current research is saying, they are saying it. Um, this tells that there could be because of the self proofreading mechanism and the recombinations that is happening. This virus has a special feature that's it uh, different uh, that can that. If, uh, 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 that furin enzyme can be triggered so that it uh, it can enter the human um, cells or human tissues. So I don't think so. Yeah, for yes, that. So I would say I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Next question, ma'am. Mm -hmm. At present, three different strains of coronavirus were said to be found in India. If vaccine mm -hmm. comes, will it work for all different strains or like flu virus? We need to take for every strain. That is what they are looking at in the research. Like, uh, what is the efficacy? Uh, is it the uh, uh, because the the which gene they are targeting? Is it uh, that is the efficacy test has to be done? So, what what are the different? Uh, uh, virus. That's why 152 vaccine candidates they are testing on now, like eight different types of vaccines, and uh, 152 candidates they are testing. So it could be uh, it could be a general one or it, like a all spec spectrum coronavirus vaccine, or it could be specific to the specific strain. Strain they still need to do the research. Research is in progress, yeah. Oh. Ma'am, next question. How long mm -hmm. the virus stays live in air? Okay, initially the CDC was, uh, when, the, when it started coming into the news in the month of January and February, they were saying it could stay on the surfaces and the air for two days or three days, now it's all gone. And they are saying maybe it would be for an hour or so, or maybe less than an hour and not on the surfaces. So in, uh, when the before everyone was afraid to receive a mail or a post, and uh, now it is not that, and people were clearing up and uh, cleaning up all the surfaces with the soap and all the disinfectants. And now it has been clear, uh, 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 like uh, changed, and they are saying it won't stay on the surfaces for too long. So maybe less than an hour, less than ten minutes or so. Maybe, yeah. Yes. Like as long as the water, like if someone, like as I was talking about the virus load, if a person coughs and if a person has coughs out. 10 particles, it will only get, so if 100, depending on the virus load, if you go into a, uh, like if you go into a gathering where there are 10 people, they are coughing and with the virus particles, there is a lot of virus load, so that will stay longer. If the less virus load, that won't stay longer. So again, virus load is the one that plays more uh, role in this. I don't think it is more than an hour. Less than an hour, I would say. Thank you, ma'am. Next question. Uh, ma'am, can, can we use RNA interference technique to silence the viral genome as it, as it enters the human cell? RNA silencing. So that is uh, what we are trying to do with the viral-like particles. So we are basically we are trying to produce that proteins that can uh, stop the virus particles. So uh, still research is going on. We we don't know like whether they can uh, uh, silencing techniques or what is happening at the uh, genomic level. So still research is going on. 
next question ma'am uh, what is the percentage of severity if a person gets infection next second time this is another question mm. like uh, definitely because if the person gets infection mm. second time or not is not recorded at and then if a person is once in gets infection and recovered that means the his uh, the person's body uh, has developed that immune response and the antibodies should be working as of now there is no such record whether the second spell will start so yeah second infection may may not happen when we don't know there are no such cases recorded recorded so far thank you next question ma'am infected people showing negative results in the initial testing but again it comes positive in further test after few more days why it's happening and also how to know that how many times we should do the test at and at what time interval that's a good question to the uh, healthcare professionals and basically initially they might be showing negative because the as i mentioned like the first level of targets would be like upper respiratory tract and then the final would be they get down to the lungs or it can affect any part of the body any organs so initially maybe the body's immune system is trying to uh do the defense and then that's why they might be tested negative and once the viral load increases so that is getting down to the lungs that's when they get test positive so that means so you uh the test should be completed uh, like it should be done periodically within uh, first uh, two weeks or so like first week and also the following second week if they show up the symptoms but if at all it is still there it is positive that means they are showing up the symptoms after some incubation period so initially they are showing negative because their incubation period has not reached yeah yeah thank you ma'am next question uh, elderly men at what age in india <laughs> that's a good question so i i am not sure though so uh, for that any any age after 50 they are saying here in canada they are saying people after 50 they are at risk and then with the generally they would start to like they are not i'm not most of them they would have some other underlying medical conditions so that's when they are more prone to this so yeah so i need to look into the statistics of india i need to go and do some research and what's coming out in the news and uh, uh medical reports uh, publications yeah mm. Okay, thank you, ma'am. One last question: yeah. Is there any case where a person is asymptomatic and having a good immune system who got recovered without any medication but played a role of carrier? Yeah. So, without any medication, yes, there is no treatment for this virus. So, these uh, whatever medicines they are only kind of help your body to. bring down the symptoms or give some uh, comfort to your body there is no treatment for this and the person who is asymptomatic uh, can you repeat the question i need to answer the question in a correct way can you repeat the question ma'am yes ma'am mm -hmm. is there any case where a person is asymptomatic and having yes. good immune system who got mm -hmm. recovered without any medication but played a role of carrier yeah definitely yes so there would there is a possibility because the person is asymptomatic but recovered because of the body's immune system so but uh, they could they could be spreading the virus at the before 
the recovery or before that uh, uh, incubation when they have recovered so at that more when there is more viral load in that person's body that's where that's when that person could be transmitting so that's why there is a possibility that can happen yeah thank you ma'am uh, one of our faculty ma'am uh, vani ma'am want to ask you one question ma'am vani ma'am please ask the question hello ma'am yeah hello ma'am ma'am good morning good i am from botany department yeah and, uh, your lecture is uh, so pleasant and informative ma'am and uh, actually uh, i am also from botany department one of the faculty yeah i know yeah, we have a know. paper we have a biotechnology one of the paper as a biotechnology with all basics ma'am like okay. generally isolation of dna pcc gel electrophore and finally we have a good information with our dna technology right okay but uh, yeah. now after after this covid our focus towards biotechnology is something different mm. yes. what i came to know is it is going to rule the world shortly yes ma'am yes. yes yeah my actual question is we have a ug course in our college biotechnology mm -hmm. combination with forensic science Okay. So suppose if we want to introduce any UG course with biotechnology, what are the other combinations we can add to that to get more meaningful and purposeful, ma'am? Like genetics, botany, microbiology, or food and nutrition. <laughs> so you want to like combination? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I would uh, say it is. Uh, coming after coming to this place yeah. so what i noticed is everything is integrated and uh, we talk about biotechnology in every subject area yes the that way the combination the good background would be like it depends on which line of biotechnology is it agriculture biotechnology research or, point yeah research yeah. point only like which mm. area of biotechnology they would like to go which stream like agricultural or medical medicine related one like how what what type of biotechnology is what they want and that's how you need to look yeah. into the research uh, areas yes and uh, if uh, people think they want to go into agricultural biotechnology then there should be a combination of our botany and all and there is biotechnology and food and nutrition if they want to develop new uh, like uh, food uh, like vitamins or new yes. uh, supplements and other and also like um, uh, production of uh, any new type of like here they do more of yeah, that yeah. Yeah. food and nutrition mm -hmm. in production of uh, there is a lot of wine research and all that goes on here nowadays so, yes uh, mm -hmm. yeah nowadays so that is mm -hmm. how like uh, that kind of combination are like you know combination with the human like uh, the animal model like if you want to go for health care think then animal model a combination of the with uh, some of the basic uh, uh, animal physiology and then uh, microbiology is the main thing that you need to have as mm -hmm. one of the subject for common to all yes. because when you are doing this kind of recombinant technology anything the first thing that we test in the microbial models so yes. microbial system is what we use so any kind kind of cloning or recombination you are doing that has to be done in the microbial model so that's why microbiology should be one of the combination so it, that's yeah. how you need to plan the courses ma'am so having yes. the combination of microbiology should be one for uh, all the things and then it can be agricultural based or it can be uh, uh, human physiology based uh thing yeah yeah okay. thank you ma'am okay nice talking to you thank you for your question thank you ma'am for answering all the queries patiently over to yeah. nanna ma'am uh, thank you very much uh, rangana ki ma'am uh, 
uh, one message to all the participants will be sending you a feedback form to your mail uh, okay. once you receive the feedback form your uh, e certificates will be posted within a week uh, now i hand over to mrs nagrani associate uh, assistant professor in the department of uh, biotech at pvr arun proposed vote of thanks over to nagrani uh good morning hello? everyone hello morning hi hello hi here good yeah good morning good morning to everyone uh, i take this privilege to present vote of thanks for this today's webinar thank you ma'am first of all thank you to ranganaike ma'am for readily accepting our invitation and enlightening us on the like uh, therapeutics diagnosis for this covid-19 which is a pandemic we are rightly fa uh, facing right now and uh, you have enlightened us and shared your knowledge about the different types of vaccines and how they will be providing us the immune response in our body and uh, the challenges which are being faced by the biotechnologists right now to provide a vaccine uh, which is safe as well as which has a good efficacy to control the uh, spread of this uh, particular covid-19 and also you have given your Uh, and i really thank you for your patient answering to all the questions which have been asked by the different participants thank you ma'am and uh, i would like to thank our management members the uh, honorable secretary sir putyam reddy sir and uh, uh, sudarshan reddy sir for giving an opportunity to organize a webinar i would like to thank our principal ma'am for continuous support in organizing such webinars and i would like to thank our hod and uh, uh, rajni ma'am dr rajni ma'am the hod of department of botany for organizing this webinar and i would also like to thank our technical staff for supporting us in organizing this and uh, last but not the least all the participants for being here to uh, in this webinar thank you thank you one and all thank you madam thank you very much thank you again thank you for giving me the opportunity for everyone for uh, joining this webinar and uh, i think i tried to share my ideas um hope uh, it and please give your feedback also um, students are biotechnology means they have some negative idea now with your uh, webinar all the eyes might have opened how biotechnology will come to rescue of any such pandemics or epidemics or whatever <laughs> yeah i thought of sharing that uh, because i uh, most of the students like before they were talk uh, more interested in of course yeah the Uh, more on finances computer science and all that so this is very very it, like everyone is looking to biotechnology these days for any therapeutics so yeah okay ma'am once again thank you good night thank you thank you very much yeah okay thank can i can i log off now yes ma'am yes okay thank you very much Okay, I'll catch up with you guys. Yeah. Let's see. I will catch you later.